Sack, developing security awareness with James Jardine, brought to you by Jardine Software. podcast. I am James and today we're going to talk a little bit about cookies. Uh, I was actually thinking about this as uh, we got some new people that we're going to be kind of training up and you know how we could use analogies to explain cookies and and how we secure them and that type of stuff. But before we get into that, uh, I just want to make a a quick mention of some of the big news that's been happening over the last week or so, um, which if you haven't seen it yet, eBay announcing that they had uh, a very large number of user credentials that were breached and retrieved by attackers uh, that included your username, um, a encrypted password, which like all breaches, we don't really know what that means. Nobody's going to come out and say that their password was plain text. Nobody's going to come out and say, hey, I was storing this against best practices for industries. So we don't really know exactly what that means as far as what do we really have going on for how they stored that password how easy is it going to be for an attacker to come back and actually crack those passwords Um, you know best practice will tell you you should be using assault you should be using uh, iterations you should be using a strong hash Um, There's lots of things that we can do, and some things are built up real easy, so we can use those like bcrypt, scrypt, uh, pbkdf, all built up. So we can just send it through a function, tell it how many times we want to iterate, and we're good. Uh, But nobody really talks about how they're storing those passwords. That's kind of interesting thought of, would it be better if they did or wouldn't it? And I'm torn either way on that. I can see where it may be beneficial that somebody actually says, hey, this is how I'm storing passwords because how you store it should be uh, not really the key to how easy it's gonna be decrypted, right? I can tell you that, hey, I'm using a unique salt per user. I'm using this large of a salt. We're using a million iterations, right? All these things are gonna put together to tell an attacker, man, this is gonna take a long time to crack these. Versus if somebody just says, I'm MD5 hashing my passwords, oh, well, you know, this isn't going to take very long, right? There's a big difference there. And to me, it, it it's kind of like the idea of having, you know, your home security sticker outside that says, hey, I use Safe Touch or I use ADT, you know, or I use nothing, right? The The attackers are looking for the easier score in most cases, so if they come across and they see, oh, hey, wait, this guy's doing pretty strong stuff. Passwords are kind of out of the question here. It's going to be too much work. Let me move on to another database where they're doing it a little bit, you know, simpler. So I don't know. I Maybe it'd be a good idea. Maybe not. Uh, I know Troy Hunts mentioned the idea of, you know, having people post that on their sites of how they're actually storing their data, how they encrypt data. Uh, but I don't know. I can see it both ways as good or bad. Uh, one of the other things I did notice, though, is SourceForge. Uh, if you're into the open source community, they actually sent out an email telling everybody that next time they log in, they'll have to reset their password because they have actually upgraded how they're storing passwords. Um, so I don't know how they were storing it previously, but they have upgraded their system. So now they are using a different technique. Maybe they're using a stronger hash. Maybe they've added assault maybe they switched completely over to a uh, component like bcrypt or something they didn't give any details Um, but it's nice to know that people are actually being proactive and updating how they're storing their passwords and unfortunately it's tough right if we upgrade how we're going to store our password it requires us to have everybody change their password (laughs) and from a user perspective that kind of stinks right i mean that's kind of a pain i gotta go through and i gotta update all my passwords but you know really i mean it's kind of a nice thing to know that they're looking out for their customers uh, and probably for themselves as well by going ahead and saying hey we're not at a certain standard let's upgrade here so uh, kudos to them for making the change pushing that out and you know willing to risk the hit from everybody of thinking 
oh man, I got to change my password, right? I don't, I didn't see a lot of backlash from it, so that's pretty cool. Um, so onto the topic really today, we talk about cookies. And I'm not talking about, you know, the cookie monster from Sesame Street. I'm not talking about what you had for, you know, with your snack at lunch. Uh, what we're talking about is this little piece of data that's stored with, in your browser, basically, when you access a site. And not every site will issue a cookie, but it's what a site developer can use to actually store just a little bit of an information with you to help kind of track you and track kind of sounds ugly because but some cookies are actually just for tracking uh, but some actually serve a very specific purpose uh, and one of those purposes being you don't have to type your username and password every time you hit a page so think of a cookie and there's a couple different analogies i have I'll, I'll try to go with the one that would hit all ages right but if you go to like your county fair or something like that where you show ID or you pay money to get in and then they give you some sort of wristband, they give you a ticket of some sort that gets you into the park, right? Maybe you go to Disney World, right? They give you some sort of ticket. When you get in there, rather than having to pay every time because you already paid, right? Just like you already authenticated by putting your username and password into the login screen of whatever application you're using. I don't want to have to do that every time, right? I want to be able to just show something very simple, whether it be my wristband, whether it be that simple little ticket, whether at Disney World it's their their cool little uh, electronic wristbands that get you into everything. But now, every time I go up to ride a, a ride or somebody wants to know if I'm supposed to be in here, I just show them my ticket, right? There's no hoopla of going through the whole baggage check and all this other stuff. It's, here's my ticket, Oh, okay, you're clear to go. And that's what a lot of times we use the cookies for within a web application is for authentication that once you put in your username and password, you get this unique value back, right? That That's your ticket, and we call it a cookie. That cookie comes down to your browser. There's two types. There's a session cookie and a persistent cookie. Session cookies just stay in your browser. They don't get written to the file system. And when you close your browser, those session cookies disappear. Right, they they get flushed away. Whereas a persistent cookie actually will kind of stick around. We can tell a persistent cookie, hey, I want you to live for, you know, ten years. And unless somebody goes in and physically deletes their cookies, that cookie will be good for ten years. Or we do something silly on our server, uh, which invalidates our cookie. Uh, but most of the time, that's not the case. So we send these cookies down, and then every time your browser makes a request to that domain that the cookie is associated with, and the cookie has a specific domain set on it. Um, so we can be pretty specific on where that cookie is good. Even within a specific site, we can say, hey, this cookie's good for this portion, this cookie's good for another portion. When the browser makes that request, it looks at the cookie jar, and I know how ironic that it's called a cookie jar, but it looks in the cookie jar and says, hey, do I have any cookies that match this criteria, right? This domain, um, these different flags to say, yes, send this cookie with this. And if it sees it, it takes that cookie, attaches it to the request, and it's just a header, right? It's just a, a, a small string of text that gets added to the request up to the server and sends it up. And then the server sees that that cookie is there, parses the value out of it, and validates, yep, this is a valid cookie. Here's the session it belongs to here's your information, right? So no longer do I have to pass a username and password every single time. I just pass this cookie back and forth, right? And it's transparent to the user. Um, the only part we see of authentication in most cases is entering our username and password. And then after that, the site just seamlessly works, right? And it's because that cookie is being passed back and forth. Now we do use cookies for other things. Um, back in the day, we used it very much for roles. Um, we still use it for roles, but, um, we did it a little simpler back then, where it was, hey, my role equals one, which means an admin. Um, and don't be mistaken, we can change the value of cookies. Um, if it's on the file system, I can just open the file up and I can change that cookie from a one to a two or a two to a three. Um, if it's not and it's just in session, there are add-ons that will let you change the values of cookies. But you can also use a proxy like Burp or Zap or Fiddler to intercept that traffic and manipulate that cookie value. It's not that hard to change it. Um, so 
we have to be cautious about if we just set roles in there and we assume from a developer standpoint that nobody can change this. We can change that value. So be cautious there that these can be modified. But there's a couple things we need to think about when we try to protect these cookies. And there's two flags in particular that we talk about the most. Uh, I already mentioned domain, which is kind of a third tag that, you know, you want to limit what that cookie is good for, right? What scope of URL that that cookie is good for. But there's two other flags. There's a flag called the secure flag. And the importance of a secure flag, and this is something that's only can be set on the server, right? The application developers determine if this is set. But if you set secure on a cookie, that means that it doesn't change how it comes down to the browser, right? Besides that it has a secure flag on it. But what happens when you make a request back to that resource, back to the server, the browser looks, and this is one of those flags that it checks, right? It goes through and it says, okay, I'm calling this domain. Do I have any cookies for this domain? Check. Okay, I'm on HTTP, so is my cookie okay to go? Does it have the secure flag set? If it does, it won't let it send over HTTP. It'll only allow that cookie to travel over a secure connection, um, which in your browser you would see has HTTPS. So that's the big difference with that secure flag, and that's strictly a limitation of, I hope the browser will do this. All modern browsers support this, um, but it's up to the browser to look at that value and say, hey, this is secure. I won't send it over a non-secure channel. Um, and this is very important to protect our cookie because, as I mentioned, this cookie is what does our authentication after we've put in our username and password. So if we pass it over the clear and somebody else can see that, maybe we're sitting in a coffee shop, maybe we're on some shared network someplace where somebody can see that cookie going back and forth, yes, maybe we did a secure channel for the login with our credentials, but while that session cookie is active... That is just as good as credentials for an attacker to be able to get into your account. Um, so if we do it on an unsecured channel, now all of a sudden somebody can grab it and then they can start using it. Right? And so that's why we're starting to see a lot more services require HTTPS or give you the option to use HTTPS for the entire session. Facebook does it. LinkedIn does it. Twitter does it now. Um, all these services now are starting to do that where they didn't a few years ago, and there was an actual add-in a few years ago that came out for Firefox that allowed you, if you were sitting in a shared network area, to capture these cookies as they flew through the unencrypted channels, and it looked for one specific, like Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, because what all those sites did is they logged you in over HTTPS. So it was a secure login, but then they dropped you back to HTTP, right? They dropped that communication channel down to an unencrypted channel. And so now that ticket, that token that you have, is being passed again in the clear. So anybody that wants to grab it, if they have access, they can grab it, read it, steal it, and then they can use it to start accessing your session. Um, so this add-in came out that allowed Firefox users, it would create a little tab on the left-hand side, and it would show you, hey, here's John, and he's on Facebook, and here's his account, and click here to access his account. Here's such and such on LinkedIn. Here's this guy on Facebook. Here's this guy on Twitter. And you could look around the coffee shop and see everybody that was on their social media. And any one of those, you just double-click their profile picture, and it would log you into their account. Um, and it, the, the goal of the project was to say, hey, this is a serious problem. This is nothing for us to take over any of these accounts. Um, and it took a little bit, but now we're starting to see that more and more companies and more and more products are actually supporting the full-time HTTPS. And it used to be that the big concern was bandwidth or processing power, that secure channels because of the encryption, it was so expensive and we can't support it all. But that's really not the case. This isn't the 1980s anymore. Um, SSL's come a long way. TLS has come a long way. Uh, we can support this stuff and there's not a huge performance degradation by using HTTPS the entire time. So that's, that's one of the most important cookies we see, and that's definitely around authentication. There's also a flag for the cookie called HTTP only. And weird enough, I, it may sound like that means, well, that only passes it over an unsecured channel. 
um, you know, and then maybe the other one should be called HTTPS only, but that's not the case. HTTP only means that that cookie is only available to HTTP requests. Um, there's lots of ways we can access a cookie from the browser. One of those ways is through scripting. Um, all browsers support JavaScript. Some still support VBScript. Um, so there's these other ways that we can access that cookie. Well, if I, the attacker, can find a flaw in your code or in your site that allows me to tell the browser, hey, when somebody loads this page up, grab their cookie and send it to me. Okay, so this is the same idea as I'm going to intercept your cookie on the way to the server. You know what? You load the page. It's going to grab your logged in cookie. Send it to me. I'm going to set that cookie as my cookie. And now we're both surfing with the same session. Uh, and this is a big concern. Um, so the vulnerability you see there um, is known as cross-site scripting, where I can add a script that will grab that by calling document.cookie and sending that information to myself, the attacker. <clears throat> but if we set the HTTP only flag to true, we can't do that. It tells the browser and it says, hey, look, browser, if somebody requests this cookie, if it says HTTP only, deny it unless it's actually a request out to our server and the server that is linked to that cookie. So I can't force a cookie for abc.com to go over to nbc.com. Um, but I also want to make sure that I don't want to allow JavaScript to access that cookie. And so session cookies are fine because rarely do we ever access those with JavaScript, right? So they should always be HTTP only. And a lot of frameworks hard code those. ASP.NET is one of those. A session cookie is hard coded HTTP only. Good luck changing that. Um, you have to actually do a lot of uh, some programming to actually manipulate that. So it's not HTTP only, but we want it to be HTTP only. Secure flag a little different just because in development environments and uh, other environments, it's hard to just say, hey, you're going to force SSL because on my development machine, I usually don't run SSL, right? I'm not using HTTPS locally. But when we get out to our test systems and those other systems, we then switch to a secure channel because now this is where the site's actually being opened up to other users. So oftentimes there's configuration values that you can set. So in Java, maybe in the web XML and .NET, it's the web.config where we can go in and say, hey, I want this one to be secure in this environment um, and not other ones. So those are the two biggest things that we think about when we talk about securing these cookies is that HTTP only that we can't, I can't mess with that cookie, right? I can't access it through JavaScript. Now, unfortunately, Java applets, Flash, those type of things still can get access to those cookies, even though they're marked as HTTP only. Um, so we have to be careful about that. But it's a step in the right direction. So when we actually do tests, one of the first things we do is we make sure that we're capturing the cookies, right? I make sure that I'm, I've fired up my proxy before I start surfing the website so I can see any cookies that come down and I can validate, okay, they are using secure cookie on here. They are using HTTP only. If they're not, if I were to go to a banking site and they're not using a secure flag on their, their session cookie, which is probably a J session ID if they're using Java, well, then wait a minute. You know, what? why aren't you guys using secure? I mean, do you guys even do security? Um, you know, it's something that we'd want to start asking questions about because maybe there's an issue there, right? If I can get, if somebody can trick me into calling the HTTP version of that site, then it'll send that cookie out. So we want to be able to check for those. They're easy to check for. Again, Firefox has extensions. I'm sure Chrome has extensions that'll let you look at the cookies that you have on your system. Go in and look at them, see what they're doing. Other types of cookies that we have, we have tracking cookies, all right? Those are there to sit there and try to track you all around the web. This is exactly the reason why when you go to one site, you all of a sudden see stuff you were searching on Amazon for, um, which is kind of scary, uh, freaky at the same time. Uh, but that's how they do a lot of that tracking is they use these cookies to track what you're doing. Um, so lots of things you can do in the browsers to try to protect against that. But I just wanted to give kind of a quick rant about cookies and what they are, where they came from. We don't really use the term cookie poisoning anymore, even though that's what we used to call it, um, you know, 10 years ago. Uh, but now 
we do want to make sure that we are protecting our cookies and, and making sure they're safe. Um, so I hope everybody enjoyed the, the quick rant, I guess a little bit longer than quick, almost 20 minutes, um, about the cookie situation. I hope it helped bring information to light about how cookies work and what they're used for. And we will talk to everybody next time. Thank you for listening. You have been listening to the DevelopSec Podcast with James Jardine. Follow us on Twitter at DevelopSec and visit our website at www.developsec.com for more episodes and information.